Please pray with me. The Lord be with you. Heavenly Father, as we, as we contemplate your word, um, open the eyes of our hearts to see Christ in all of the scriptures and make us receptive to the workings of your Holy Spirit. We ask all of this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Let's just start trucking through the text here then. Thank you, my friend, for, for sharing your bulletin with me. So at the beginning of uh, the passage, Jesus said to the disciples, The kingdom of God is as if a man should scatter seed upon the ground and should sleep and rise night and day, and the seed should sprout and grow, and he knows not how. So as I, as I mentioned in my sermon, there's what we call the messianic expectation. Um, you look to passages in the Old Testament. Just Does anyone know what book is most cited? What Old Testament book is most cited in the New Testament? It's actually the Psalms, um, but Isaiah is up there. The top four are Genesis, Deuteronomy, Isaiah, and the Psalms. But the Psalms are quoted. Of the Psalms, what is quoted more than anything else, if you had to guess? Which Psalm? 23rd. I don't know if the 23rd Psalm is directly quoted in the New Testament. It's actually Psalm 110. And Jesus uses this to try to stump the Pharisees at one point. Do you, does anyone remember that passage? It, it, Ed. It gives. Yes. My guess is because I sure can't understand it. Yes. Is it the one about how David said uh, to my Lord, you know, and then who's the Lord and who's the That's right. That's it. It is a tough one. Yeah, it's Psalm 110, verse 1 is, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet, which is a messianic prophecy. And then so he's kind of flummoxing the, the Pharisees by saying, Who, if, if, it's, if it's David talking to the Lord, why does he say the Lord say to my Lord? So he must be speaking for someone other than himself, right? So he's saying, he's speaking about me, guys, is what, he, what Jesus is saying. But he says, you know, the sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. There's this expectation that the Messiah is going to come and he's going to make his enemies a footstool. He's going to conquer them. And so part of the expectation isn't just that like Messiah is going to come and everything's going to be hunky dory. He's going to crush our enemies. That's what that's what that's what the Israelites are expecting. They're anticipating. So. When he tells them, well, here's what the kingdom of God is like, it's like it's like a it's like a farmer sowing seed in the ground and it's night and day and it grows while he's sleeping and then they harvest it. They're like, what? That's not what we read about because their expectation is all of this conquering language or there's Psalm 1, there's Psalm 2, um, which has the idea of is also a conquering enemies imagery. Uh, there's the there's the whole covenant that, da that David made with God, or that God made with David in, uh, was it Samuel, 2 Samuel chapter 7. There's the covenant that God makes with Samuel, and he says, you know, the scepter's never going to come leave your kingdom. You'll have a, a descendant on the throne forever, and I will bless those who bless you, and I'll curse you, those who curse you, which is an expansion of the promise that he made to Abraham, right, in Genesis 12 through 17. So all of this is the type of expectation that people are expecting. But then you also do have these passages in the Old Testament that include um, farming imagery and speak, and speak of the Lord either as uh, uh, what we call a pastor in the classic sense or a shepherd. And not just Psalm 23, but there's passages in uh, the prophetic literature that speak of the priests supposing to be the shepherds of Israel, but they're failing at their role. And so there's this whole other thread of imagery, even the vine and the branches imagery that Jesus uses in the Gospel of John, that comes from the prophets as well. Um, so they had taken one thread of Old Testament expectation from their scriptures regarding what the Messiah came to do and what the kingdom of God was going to look like, but they missed all of these other images. And so Jesus is pulling hard in the other direction and saying, well, let's start with the agricultural imagery. It's like a seed planted in the ground that grows and then is harvested. 
And so the and even the emphasis of night and day, that's how that's how that's how the ancient that's how the Israelites viewed time. So uh, if you look at the creation account in Genesis one, it says it is evening and it was morning the first day. And so when he's recounting the time, the passage of time that the farmer is experiencing, he's pointing out the whole point is that time is passing. So it, it, that's why it says. And he should sleep and rise night and day because that's how they viewed the passage of time. So he's just trying to give the idea that time is passing by and uh, the kingdom is growing. And you're not supposed to do this in a sermon, but the Greek word that's used there when it says that, uh, the, that the earth produces of itself, the Greek word there is automate, which is where we get the, the word automatic. So this whatever this this whole process that's happening it's sort of happening automatically independent of the farmer first the blade then the ear then the full grain in the ear and when the grain is ripe he puts it in he puts in the sickle because the harvest has come and that is actually a reference to the book of Joel i want to say it's it's chapter 3 verse 14 but Harvest, sickling and harvesting, reaping and harvesting, almost always is a sign in both the Old Testament and the New Testament of judgment, of sort of the last things. So he's alluding to that this is the whole process from the planting of the seed to the end when there's the final judgment. The kingdom of God is like this whole process. So another allusion to the Old Testament because the harvest has come. And then the next parable, he goes on, what can we compare the kingdom of God or what parable shall we use? So he's like saying, it's really hard to describe this to you guys, but I'm trying to. It's like the grain of a mustard seed, which when sown upon the ground is the smallest of all seeds in the earth. So people who deny the authority of the Bible will say, well, technically it's not the smallest seed on the earth. But my, my retort would be, I think he's just trying to use imagery he's speaking hyperbolically he's in the middle of a parable let's not let's not get him on a technicality like that yet when it is sown it grows up and becomes the greatest of all shrubs and puts forth large branches so that the birds of the air can make their nests in its shade and there are several places in the old testament that speak of uh the flourishing of the kingdom of god like a mighty tree the one of the more famous ones is in Daniel chapter 4. There's a tree and it says it fills the whole earth and that like the birds of the air come and nest in it. And there's this sense of uh, harmony and peace and flourishing and everything growing the way it's supposed to be. Because going all the way back to Genesis, everything was, humanity was called to fill the earth and subdue it, be fruitful and multiply. And then they were supposed to tend either tend and keep or work and keep the earth, but they sort of, they failed at their job because they couldn't even kick a snake out of the garden. But the sense that everything that started out small in, you know, plant form or whatever is going to reach full bloom to the point of either, you know, the mighty tree imagery from Daniel or I want to know if it really says shrub. I want to, I want to look that up in the Greek because it, it kind of, doesn't sound quite as exciting with the word shrub in there. So now I want to look that up. But yeah, that tree imagery is very common that in the, in the Old Testament. And Jesus is pulling on that. As you can see, that he's actually, even if he doesn't directly quote the Old Testament, the Old Testament is kind of the vocabulary that everyone spoke, right? You can kind of sense that when you're seeing this. And then it says, with many such parables, he spoke to them. And as they were able to hear it, as they were able to hear it, that's a big qualifier, right? Do they, have, do they have the eyes to see? Do they have the ears to hear? You know, connected with your question from earlier. He did not speak to them without a parable, but privately to his own disciples. He explained everything. Thank you guys for coming. God bless you.